Okay, now teaching. So the next thing that you need to understand if you want to understand how fiqh laws were sort of like developed over the years is the method of how the Prophet ﷺ taught the religion. Yeah, because I mean, if 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 we were to sit here and we all sat around and we had a pen and a paper and, a, and we brainstormed, what would be the ideal way for the religion in the early years to have been taught? The ideal way would have been get a cameraman, camera crew, and they would go around and record all the Sahaba, all the actions of the Prophet ﷺ, document it, make like a whole sort of catalog, encyclopedia of every single thing. And then the whole religion would be documented for us until the day of judgment, right? But see, the problem with that is is that the religion would become very difficult for us. Like the religion would become so strict, we wouldn't be able to move or show any flexibility in the laws uh, over the years. So the way that the religion has come down to us is the main aspects of the religion were revealed. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he taught Sahaba. And then we kind of used those case studies to try and build a bigger picture. So the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ was done in, in a, a different type of style, you can say. So here are some examples of the Prophet ﷺ teaching. Now, there's actually a good book that's written by Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda. Um, it's called... Um, uh, it's called a Rasul Muallim. Uh, I think in English it's called something the the the, the, the prophetic teachings of the Prophet Sallam. It's by Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda, and he collects in there forty different ways of how the Prophet Sallam used to actually teach the Sahaba, depending on who he was talking to. So sometimes he taught by example, right? Himself doing something and people would watch. So he was like a role model. Sometimes he would actually teach people by throwing a question at them. So he would throw a question at Sahaba, and he would say something like. Um, what tree best describes a believer? And so companions start thinking, oh, what tree is this? Right? And then one Sahabi, Ibn Omar, said, I knew the answer, but I was too scared to tell the Prophet. And I went home and told my dad, I knew the answer. <laughs> my dad goes, You know, why didn't you say you would have made me proud? Because yeah, I was shy because all the other Sahaba were there. And he goes, What was it? He goes, It was the date palm. Observations as well. So, observations is where someone, for example, like observes the actions. Yeah, so Prophet Sahaba are like looking at the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, looking at how he prays, looking at how he raised his finger when he prayed, looking at how he used to raise, where did he raise his hands, was it to his ears or to his shoulders? When he used to perform wudu, uh, how did he used to wash his face? Did he used to wash it two, three times, twice? All of this has been documented, uh, you know, by Sahaba in like, you know, separate cases. Answering questions as well. Sahaba would pose a question, or oh, Messenger of Allah, when's the day of judgment coming? And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, what, what have you got ready for it? He goes, nothing. He goes, but I love Allah and his messenger. And he goes, a person will be the, with the one that he loves. And changing the question. Sometimes someone would ask a question, but he would rephrase the question and say, you should have asked it like this. In order for them to start thinking about how, you know, how you're supposed to approach the, uh, the, the teaching of the religion. Okay, so, you know, you guys are all students, mashallah, and you guys all know different ways of teaching. Imagine... I mean, some of you guys are probably medical students. Um, what's the best way to learn medicine? Yeah, is it like, you know, you spend 20 years with a doctor and then, you know, tr trial and error, you find out all the methods or so an apprenticeship method, would that be better? Or for example, like seeing in class and theoretically having everything explained to you on the board and then you memorizing that and giving an exam, is that the best, best method of teaching? What is the best method of teaching? This can be debated all the time. So you got the classroom method. I call this a classroom method right, where everything can be taught to you on the board. And you got the non-classroom method, which is basically a more sort of like interactive, visual, uh, you know, hands-on, experience-based uh, method of teaching. So I, I give this example. I think Amir remembers this example very well. Yeah, how to make cover tea, I think. After that day, Amir's probably learned how to make you know, special tea. So I'm going to teach you guys how to make tea, right? So how do you make tea? All right, the, this is it. Here you go. Take one full cup of tap water, yeah? So make sure you make notes here because you know, I'm, I'm not going to say it again. Pour into kettle and switch on. Right, Very important point there, <laughs> switching on part. <laughs> very important. Otherwise, you know, you're not really going to get far. After water boils, pour into cup. Add one PG tips pyramid tea bag. I've actually changed my opinion on that one, yeah? I've changed my opinion on that one. So now it's Yorkshire tea. Uh, add two full teaspoons of silver spoon sugar. Actually, I've given up sugar now as well. So, but you can still add it. Stir with a teaspoon clockwise for 10 seconds. Add pasteurized milk till the color turns creamy white and ready to drink. Okay, now 
uh, I've actually gone to a new madhab now, which is stir until it becomes stir until it becomes um, like Werther's original. Yeah, you know Werther's original. Yeah. So for me, it has to be like Werther's original. If it's too light or too dark, then uh, sorry, you know, you're not really, you know, gonna gonna make tea for me again. So now, what about blue PT? Yeah, blue PT. That's my that's my favorite tree, tea. Or one of my favorite teas. Anyway, so this is how. Now, if I told you this, right? If I tell you how to make tea, right? Um, if I if I if I you know remove the screen, and I say to you, okay. Now tell me how to make a tea. Most likely, 99.9% .9 of you guys would be able to repeat what I said, right? You'd know it right? without problem, yeah? Okay. This is because the classroom method is very thorough, right? It covers all bases, You're gonna cover everything. So you're not really gonna have much of a problem. The problem is that wasn't the way most of the religion was taught in the time of the Prophet It wasn't taught in a classroom method because the situation, the circumstances, the culture, the, the, you know, how people were brought up, the, uh, the, the, the literacy of the people as well was different. So the Prophet Sallallahu the way he would teach would be like this. Like watch a person make tea, learn a few steps, but not in particular order. So it's either like imagine I just in front of you made tea. Right? I didn't say a word. Lips are sealed and I make tea. And then I say, OK, now you make tea now. Right, so you're probably thinking, um, excuse me, you know, how long does how which direction do I stir it in? Um, you know, the tea bag. How do I put the tea bag in? Or learn a few steps. But imagine, so imagine what what I mentioned earlier on. But take out, let's say, eight steps from there. Yeah, and then try to figure out the other steps yourself. So this gives us an understanding of how the scholars, the problem the scholars had when they were trying to understand the whole picture of Salat just from a few fragments of narrations that have reached us and like from the practice of the Sahaba, right? So, you know, if you've got like, let's say, seven hadith that describe how to pray Salat, but you can't really link them together, right? Uh, you're going to have a problem because you're going to have to come up with a solution to something that's not mentioned in the narrations. Like, for example, let's say uh, we all know that, let's say a person praying their Salat, they fold, fold their hands, all right? Uh, what if a person doesn't have hands? How does he pray? Okay. We all know that you stand on the ground when you pray Salat. But what if you're an astronaut on space station? How do you pray your Salat? Well, you weren't told that in the class. Uh, okay, that's a good one. Okay. What if um, you're on Mars, right? And uh, I was telling some of the guys, I was actually writing a, a book about the Muslim on Mars. It was supposed to be like a little short story novel kind of thing. And it was about uh, the reason I was going to write it was because I was thinking to myself, how would be how would it be uh, for a Muslim who lives on Mars? How would they figure out how to apply fiqh to their life? Like, how would they fast in Ramadan? Because you know, you forget one moon. Earth's got one moon. Mars has got like two moons or one and a half moons. How do they figure out how to pray? Uh, how to um, you know fast in Ramadan? And then you got the issue with the sun rising, and then you got the issue with no water on Mars, and then you got all these issues. So this is the problem that scholars have. There's lots of gaps they have to fill in. So imagine like a big jigsaw puzzle, hundred piece jigsaw puzzle, and you got eighty pieces missing, seventy pieces missing. Right? The scholars have to use all the other evidences to try and you know imagine what the other pieces would look like. All right. So the difference in the company of the companions is another issue as well. So, for example, like there were some companions who stayed with the Prophet Sallallahu for a very long time, accepting Islam, right? Some of them accepted Islam from early years. Some of them only accepted Islam a few days before he passed away. You got varying companions. Expeditions for battle. Some of the companions participated in the battles with the Prophet Sallallahu They learned more. Some of them did it. Tending land and business. Some of the companions wouldn't be able to stay with the Prophet Sallallahu Maybe they'd visit him twice a week, once a week. Once a month, living very far away, well, that meant like maybe only once in your lifetime you got to meet him. Member of a family, maybe you're one of the member of the family of the Prophet ﷺ or extended family, you get to meet him more. And then women, obviously the women would have uh, different exposure to the Prophet ﷺ as well in them days. So a lot of these issues now would make a difference. So if you had a time machine, you go back in time, which of the companions are you going to want to stay in the company if you had to choose only one companion to learn the religion from? Which companion are you going to choose? 
you're obviously going to choose the one who you know stayed the most with the Prophet. Like, for example, Umar radiallahu anhu. Yeah, he stayed. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. The, you know, the, the major khulafa. Uthman radiallahu Ali radiallahu anhu. Aisha radiallahu anha. Yeah, these are the ones who you want to stay with because they understood it the best. You believe they understood it the best. But then you might come across some companions who only met the Prophet once in their life. And maybe they know something, but maybe maybe they made a mistake. Maybe they didn't hear the whole whole statement from the Prophet. But someone else, a senior companion, heard it better. And this happens sometimes. So this is another factor which results in how it's going to affect how we see the laws as well. Yeah. Um, so I'll give you an example. Example of this is uh, Ibn Umar uh, radiallahu anhu, he says that, uh, that if a person cries, that the Prophet said, if a person cries over the deceased, someone's died, and someone cries over the deceased, the person in the grave is, to, is given to, uh, torture, is tormented. So when Aisha radiallahu anha, she heard this narration, she, she called Ibn Umar and she says, you're wrong. He didn't say this. She said, what basically happened was, is that there was a there was a uh, a lady who had passed away and she was not Muslim in Medina, and the Prophet ﷺ just said he just said that the um, uh, uh, the family are crying whilst the deceased is being is, is tormented. In other words, it was just coincidental that he was saying they're crying and they don't realize that their family member is being tormented in the grave. So it was like there was context behind it, and Ibn Umar didn't hear that context. So sometimes this is what happens in narration. This is what you have to sort of like sieve through and try to work around that. Okay, so this is another factor. Finally, the last part now. This is ijtihad now. So linguistic meaning of ijtihad. Right? Ijtihad basically means to exhaust all your efforts. It's like, for example, you know, you guys writing a dissertation assignment or, you know, you know, writing up some sort of like important document. You got to do lots of research and then you have to come to your conclusion Right. This is what ijtihad is all about. So the Islamic definition, the the, the so like scientific definition, exhausting all efforts to reach the understanding of an Islamic ruling. That's what you do. You exhaust all of your efforts in trying to reach the understanding of an Islamic ruling. Like if I say to you, okay, for next week, I want you to research. If the, a person was to recite Surah Fatiha twice in their Salat, do they have to do Sajda Sahu? You're thinking, uh, I don't know. Let me check. So you go, you find you find all the ayats, you can find all the hadith, you can find all the statements of the sahaba, you can find, you try to put them all together, and then the answer you come out with would be considered to be ijtihad. Now, I'm not saying you guys have got ijazah to do ijtihad. I'm just saying this is basically what it would entail for an expert. Yet someone said, for example, like, um, how does an astronaut uh, pray salat? How does he pray? Right, so... The scholars would have to use all their efforts to try and come up with the best conclusion that they could, the answer that they could, they didn't come out with, for that particular situation. Um, okay, I'll give you an example of this. What's an example of this? An example of this is the Asr at Banu Qurayza. So, the Prophet Sallallahu came back from a battle. This was the Battle of Ahzab, roughly about in the fifth and sixth year. When he came back from the battle, he was about to take off his armor when the angel Jibreel salam, came to him and said, you have to go to the tribe of Banu Qurayza, right? Don't take your armor off yet. You have to deal with them because they were treacherous and they actually schemed against the Muslims to kill the Muslims behind their back. So the Prophet salam, told all the companions, and this was like in the afternoon time, he says, he says, none of you should pray your Asr except in Banu Qurayza. So they prayed their Dhuhr, but they hadn't prayed their Asr. He goes, none of you should pray your Asr except in the village of Banu Qurayza. So all the companions put their gear back on, got on their mounts, and they began to travel from Medina all the way to Banu Qurayza. Now, there was a problem. All of a sudden, the sun was about to set. It was very close to setting. So some of the companions, they asked each other, what should we do? Some of the companions said, we are going to listen to what the Prophet said. He clearly said to us that none of you should pray your Asr except in Banu Qurayza. So we're going to pray over there. Whether we pray on time or we pray late, we're going to listen to what he told us. It's fine. They went on their way. The other group of companions said no. He said, that's not what the Prophet ﷺ meant. He didn't mean don't pray your asr on time and pray late over there. What he meant was, it was like saying to people, quickly go, quickly set off. right? And he didn't mean it literally. He meant it metaphorically. So 
we're going to pray on time. So they prayed on time and then they went, right? And then they got there after Maghrib. So the two groups of companions, they looked at the statement of the Prophet in different ways, right? They did ijtihad, right? The first group, they just looked at the literal words and they just followed the literal words. The second group, they actually looked at on the board, you can see, surely Salah is an obligation on the believers that is tied up with time. Yeah, that they understood every Salat has to be prayed on time unless you've got a valid excuse. And they said, this, this, in this situation, the Prophet ﷺ did not intend us to not pray Asr on time. When they both got to the Prophet ﷺ and they both presented their, 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 their ijtihad, the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell any of them off. He didn't say, you're wrong or you're wrong. Right? So this shows that there were companions in the time of the Prophet ﷺ doing this. Okay. What's the method? The Prophet ﷺ, he knew that the companions are going to face a space station situation, right? Where they're going to come across a situation where they don't know the answer to. So he gave them like a system. So this is a famous hadith of Mu'ad radiallahu anhu in Abu Dawood and other books, Tirmidhi, where the Prophet ﷺ sent Mu'ad to Yemen. And before he sent him, he said to him, Mu'ad, he says, you know, if someone asks you a question over there, he says, how are you going to answer it? He goes, I'm going to give it from the Quran. He goes, okay, but what if you don't find it explicitly in the Quran? He goes, I'm going to give it from your sunnah. He goes, okay, what if you don't find it in my sunnah? He goes, then I'll try my best to answer it. And then he tapped him on the back and he said, Alhamdulillah, or praise to Allah, the one who has given my, my messenger the ability uh, to be able to do this. And, and I'm pleased with that. So this is basically the approach. Quran, if it's not in the Quran, the sunnah, if it's not in the sunnah, and you got no other answer, then you try your best. So, uh, th these were like two examples, right? Cause and comparison. Yeah. So, in other words, um, uh, this is basically to do with the idea of the Prophet ﷺ, him, him sort of like trying to make them understand the cause of something and comparing. Like, if if you're faced with a situation, like the tea example, let's say I say to you, okay, I'm going to put you in a kitchen, right? The kitchen's only got in there, let's say, um, um, it hasn't got water, it's got lemonade in there. I want you to make tea for me. How are you going to make tea? So either you're going to try to look for comparison, like what's the comparison between tea and lemonade in order for me to make something, or you're going to be looking for the cause. What's the cause? Yeah. So for example, like the Hajj and debt issue, what's the Hajj and debt issue? A lady came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and she said, oh, Messenger of Allah, she said that my mother's passed away and she was supposed to do Hajj. Can I do it on her behalf? And the Prophet said, okay, let's look at this. Instead of saying yes or no, he said, if your mother had a debt, she had to pay the neighbor. Would you pay the debt off? He said, yeah, I'd pay the debt off. He goes, well, isn't the debt of Allah a greater debt? So he was showing her how to draw comparisons between two things when you come out with a, an answer. So this is an example of the comparison. And the leftover cat, right? Basically, the Prophet ﷺ one day was doing wudu and he was doing it from a bowl. He's scooping up the water from a bowl and a cat came. So he lowered the bowl for the cat. The cat drank from the bowl and then he carried on his wudu. And then Aisha radiallahu anha was watching and he said to Aisha radiallahu anha, he said, are you amazed at this? And she said, yes. Yeah. She said, why did you do it? He says, because the cat is an animal that frequents a salah. Meaning that she assumed that the cat's saliva was impure because the cat was like an animal that we don't eat. So it's impure. So, but when the cat saliva went into the water, she thought it contaminated the water. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam continued doing wudu. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam showed her the cause for why he done it. He said, because this cat is an, a creature that frequents us a lot. Meaning, remember we said in the beginning about the, 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 the unique features of the legislation of the Quran. One was that to remove difficulties. Now, is it difficult to try and avoid the cat touching anything in your house? It's difficult, isn't it? So therefore, the rule will be reduced for this. The more difficulty that you're going to face, the ruling is going to be reduced. So in this case, he was showing her uh, this ruling. Okay, it's the summary of the laws now. So. Fiqh eventually so deals with belief, worship, family system, transactions, government issues, upholding the law, foreign policy, food, drink, clothing, and social manners, right? That's eventually how the scholars started to kind of like classify now, like I mentioned earlier on in the beginning. So year by year, this is like the final thing now, year by year legislation. This is now basically in Medina. Remember I told you the 13 years of Makkah, hardly any legislation was passed in, in, in Makkah, in the Quran. Hardly any. In Medina, in year one, the khutbah started. Juma khutbah. Azan. Azan started in the first year. Fighting, the Muslims were able to 
uh, take arms against the enemy. Uh, the year two, fasting started. Uh, the Salat of Eid started. Uh, and Zakat started in year two. Year three, inheritance law started. The divorce law started in year three. Um, year four, the shortening of the prayer started. Uh, the stoning issue of the fornicator was legislated in year four. The hijab rules were legislated in year four. This is in Medina, by the way. Yeah. Uh, year five, Hajj and Umrah was legislated. Uh, Salat al-Istisqa, the rain prayer, we know in the fifth year it occurred. Number six, the prohibition, the, the, the pilgrim who was prohibited from carrying on, yeah, the Ihsar, uh, uh, Sulh and Salam. So this was international treaties was legislated in the sixth year. Uh, Sayyid al-Muhrim, hunting in the state of Ihram, the rulings regarding that were given in the sixth year. And finally, uh, the prohibition of eating donkey's meat was in the seventh year, we know that. In the eighth year, the rulings of retaliation, kisas, when someone murders someone and then their life is taken. The rulings of hudud and ta'zir, criminal dis disciplinary measures in the eighth year. In the ninth year was the prohibition of polytheists entering Masjid al-Haram, we know in the ninth year. And that's it, basically.